Welcome in to Rounding the Bases Live, presented by Enterprise Bank and Trust. Another episode coming your way. I'm Joel Goldberg, and thanks again for joining. We're live, pretty much live every single day, Monday through Friday at noon. When I say we, I mean me and whoever my guest or guests are. And we'll continue this for quite a long time. And also, these will come up. You could watch the links afterwards on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and we'll push all that stuff out there. So uh, again, thanks to our new sponsor, Enterprise Bank and Trust. Have another announcement tomorrow along with our guest. But first off, as is the case every day, I hope that you are all doing well, that you are most importantly healthy, most importantly staying home if at all possible, and we'll continue to push through this. The guest that I have today is one that I have wanted to have well, I say for a while, this thing just started a week ago today, but I knew as soon as this went down that I really wanted to be able to have with me uh, Dr. Allison Edwards because um, she knows what's going on. She's in the middle of all of it. So we welcome right now to the broadcast, my friend, Dr. Allison Edwards. And um, boy, I, you know, I, I think I, I saw you putting out something on social media maybe a week ago. As I keep saying, I, I, I don't remember what was a week ago or two days ago, but yeah. but as I read what you were saying, and you are always so passionate with everything, I, I know you well enough to know that there was this plea for help, which I felt was representative of probably most healthcare workers around the nation, if not the world. So first and foremost, how's it going for you? It's good. It's going well. Um, I like how you called me passionate and not ranty because it's easy. I, I try, I, I'm like a positive, like positive pessimist and optimistic pessimist. I don't know. Um, it's, it's going well. We have a really unique business model for primary care in that instead of um, accepting insurance and instead of billing for every transaction as to what we do, we take care of people on a monthly membership fee. Um, and so it's been a really interesting experience to see how, like from a business model sense, our clinic operates versus how like the the traditional healthcare system is scrambled to catch up. And I mean, nobody's nobody's doing it well. I mean, we're all it's all crazy, but um, we're doing OK. And first off, I would say a little bit of cross promotion here, I guess, to my my weekly podcast and season four just started yesterday. Ray Kowalik, the CEO of Burns and McDonald was the guest, but but Allison was a guest back on, I think it was season two, uh, about a year ago, it was March 15th. So if you go into, you know, wherever you find your podcast, look for Rounding the Bases, you'll you'll hear my interview with Allison and get a better feel for what direct primary care is. And, and certainly we could talk a little bit more about that today, but most doctors that are in direct primary care you mentioned the monthly uh the monthly service uh, you guys provide everything every other doctor would and, and more because it's across the board i mean you know you you, you twist an ankle or yeah. um, break an arm and there's a good chance that you you may be able to handle that first saves a lot of money all kinds of stuff so you can learn more about that but what most docs in direct primary care are are also entrepreneurs because you're yeah. running your own business without the insurance and all of that how are you handling the amount of people that are trying to get a hold of you right now and what most likely is to come in the next, you know, three, four, six, eight weeks? Right. I um, I ran into a friend um, on a walk separated by six six feet. We were separated. Don't nice. worry. Um, nice. But I ran into a friend and she asked how we were doing. And I was like, it's really it's kind of like the calm before the storm mm. um, where here in Kansas City, we absolutely have you know, cases of people who have contracted COVID-19. We have had people who have died from it. Um, and my heart goes out to everybody who's struggling with the economic impact of, of the closure of our city. But at the same time, we're in a, a spot of relative calm right now because it's not as widespread as, um, as we're seeing in some of the major coastal cities. And so our, our motive or our, our MO here has been to be incredibly proactive with our patients and reaching out and communicating, you know, what do we know? What do we don't like what we don't know? And there's a lot of stuff that we actually don't know um, what we're able to provide, what we're not able to provide all of those things. And just be very, very clear and transparent and say, here's what we have for you. Here's what we don't have for you. And I think our patients have been 
uh, grateful for that openness, but also it's helped with the communication so that I don't have 500 separate emails of people asking me, you know, can you test? We've been really proactive at putting it out there and being really open with it. So that's helped. Yeah. I mean, it's look, it's on, obviously it's on everyone's mind. It, it, I don't know that I've ever seen anything in our lifetime that, that, truly affects everyone. And even for people, the quote unquote non-believers, and I, I'm of the belief that everyone at some point will come to understand or believe this because as it continues to grow and spread, you will know someone that right. has it. And that's just the reality of it. So, you know, maybe it, it, it doesn't feel as real to somebody at the moment that's outside of New York. Right. Maybe, I think it feels real for most people. I mean, I, I uh-huh. you know, I'm... I'm disheartened when I see, so for instance, and I I hope I don't out anybody here, but I, you know, we've been in the neighborhood, we've been, we've been doing some driveway happy hours and separating all the chairs. And, you know, I haven't shaken a hand in, you know, a few weeks now. And, and that's, that's really been nice, but, you know, I stopped over to friends the other Mm -hmm. night and then, and somebody is walking through the neighborhood that, that isn't really on that end of the block, I guess, or it's a big neighborhood. And he walked up to, to my buddy and shook his hand. I'm like, no, like, what? no, don't shake hands. And, and uh, okay. So like, make sure you wash afterwards and all that. But I was like, how do you not know this yet? So right. there are different levels of people where, where they're at, where they're going. I, I mean, obviously the shelter in place is affecting everybody for the most part. Um, where have you seen sort of the reaction within the community go Cause it seems like it, it's, it's moving quick in terms of, if you look, if you look back five days ago or a week ago, the world was different. Yeah. Um, <laughs> every, I feel like we're all drinking from a fire hose. When I was in yeah. med school, they were like, Oh, you know, you're, this is going to be a struggle. You're going to have to learn a lot. It's not like drinking from a water fountain. It's like drinking from a fire hose, you know, where like the information is like, boom, right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that we're all at that, at that point where, We do the best we can, but we also live in a world where there's so much information that digesting it in uh, in in digestible bites like becomes actually difficult. Like you get on Twitter and you're going to just be inundated. You get onto any you know uh, reliable news source and they're updating it by the minute, you know. And so um, I have been for my own sort of mental health. I have been keeping like a weekly log of like the major changes that are that are relevant to me as a healthcare professional, but also relevant in a major way to my patients. And every week I push that out. I say just updates from the last week. So it's condensed. I you you know me that I'm I always convince people I'm like you got to get off social media, man. It's bad for your it's bad for your mental health. Mm-hmm. And so I've always tried to find ways to to still communicate to people what they need to know without them getting stuck in these like anxiety, rumination, you know, rabbit holes. There is a lot of anxiety right now. And and I don't want it, to, it's so easy for me to tell people just, you know, just breathe or just whatever. Mm-hmm. And it's like, first off, anxiety is a real thing. And there are a mm-hmm. lot of people that, that battle anxiety issues and were doing so before this. And now suddenly you add in potentially loss of job, loss of revenue, kids running around the house, you know, having to, having to get them into school, different ages of those kids. Um, that those are just a few, a right. few of the the issues. I mean, everyone in some form or another is dealing with with something. How, how are you instructing your patients, or or how are you giving them optimism? I guess. I mean, I, I know that you're an honest person. Um, you tell it like it is. We yeah. do need optimism. At the same time, I don't think we want to be fooled here. We want to know the truth. So, what are you telling your patients? Um. I mean, I think this is this is the big question. Like as as we were talking about where people just don't feel like it's real. I think the thing that people feel that is real is this mm-hmm. sense of, of just simmering kind of anxiety within. Mm-hmm. Um, to take a step back, and if I'm getting in the weeds, please cut me off. But go, go. Back, like anxiety is a um, it's like an innate thing that we have as humans. It evolved with us to protect us. So when we were, you know, cavemen and we saw a saber tooth tiger, we had to react with that adrenaline rush turning on. We had to have that, you know, your heart thumps, your blood pressure goes up, your pupils dilate. You can feel a little bit queasy. Your blood gets redirected to organs that need it. That's adaptive. That's how we survived. People who didn't have that response were were eaten by saber tooth tigers. They didn't pass on their genes. You know, that's evolution. And so 
so we can't get rid of anxiety is is the so so that's the blunt truth and that's hard to talk about is that we actually can't eliminate it what we can do are the sorts of things where we start to modify how we react to the, to the anxiety and so while financial strain is an incredibly uh, real thing for people while dealing with your kids is incredibly real in that moment like you were alluding to you can say you know you have to breathe through it and things like that um, but that can be really tough and that can be if it's not a skill that you're used to executing it's not going to be something that comes naturally mm -hmm. and so in this new normal what I try and help people work on is find the habits that work for you to reset uh, when the weather is nice, it is okay to go outside. And like you're saying, socially distance, please get some fresh air, please get some sunshine. When the weather is bad, find a moment to isolate. If you can even grab five, 10, 15 minutes um, while the kids are napping or while your spouse can look after them and and learn how to meditate. This is a great time to learn how to meditate. Mm. Um, if you're into podcasts, Brene Brown just launched one. Um, she's an incredible, uh, she's an incredible one. A PhD researcher has great science behind what she says to talk about um, connection and how to sort of get through these moments. So there are resources out there. Um, ultimately, the biggest thing I can say is that this is tough. There's there's no sugarcoating it, that this is this is hard. Um, and it's okay to feel angry and it's okay to, to feel that frustration. Visiting right now with Dr. Allison Edwards here on Round of the Bases Live presented by Enterprise Bank and Trust. and. Uh, uh, Brene Brown is starting to get a lot of play uh, for those that follow her work. Th that's not a new name, but I mean, she was on 60 Minutes the other night. But all these resources are, you know, every little bit potentially could help and and make things easier because we're in this, I think, for the, the long haul. Everybody is saying that this is going to get worse before it gets better. It feels like they've been saying that for a couple of weeks. And now it sounds like certainly beginning in New York and then it'll start to move that, that the worst is getting close yeah how as a doctor as someone on the front lines are you preparing for what lies ahead um i don't know hmm. uh, you put one foot in front of the other and you just keep waking yeah. up um i think that by design as physicians we our entire training is to come up with the next step and then to anticipate the step after the next step and to anticipate that step following those next two steps, because that's how we do medicine, right? You say, this is the plan that I have for this person right now. And if it fails, we do this. And if it fails, we do this. That's how, that's how doctors are trained. And so to a certain extent, um, doctors are incredibly, and, and nurses and healthcare professionals, everybody who works in healthcare are, re, are incredibly resilient to having chaos and having things sort of implode because that's what happens all the time. Mm -hmm. um, when we're caring for people in the hospital setting. Uh, from an outpatient, so so I have my world where I work in the emergency room mm -hmm. um, and I do that about once a month. So I'm a couple way, or a couple weeks away from heading back to the ER. Um, in our outpatient world here in the clinic, we're doing the best we can to protect our patients. So much like every other clinic, we are moving to uh, telephone visits, essentially only, we do video conference visits, much like kind of how we're communicating mm -hmm. now. Uh, we have open email access with our patients so they can send us pictures of rashes. They can send us pictures of, you know, refills that they need. They can, it's, we try and be really openly communicative and that helps protect us from getting sick. It helps protect our patients from getting sick. Super, super important for both of those things to happen. Um, getting protective, uh, personal, uh, protective equipment, PPE, as you've heard in the news is a freaking mess. Um, so that's how we're protecting people just through physical distancing. So I, I want to go there a little bit. I, I'd never heard of PPE before, but I mean, we, we certainly know what everyone's. You know what, Joel? You probably need some PPE when baseball season restarts to keep you from getting so wet all the time. Yeah, right, okay. right, right. We no, I, I'm, I tough How it out. It? No, no. When this all ends, I will donate all my PPE to you to wear on for your post game interviews, and you can just walk around in PPE. I feel like others are more more deserving of that than me. Plus, you know, sometimes you gotta you gotta take it. It's just a bucket of water, right? I I think we we would all like to see that right now. Um, yes, we would. I would you know, love to donate all of my PPE to you because I would love to not need it. Well, you know, and I've I've talked about this a lot. I mean, I I really came to the realization in recent years that that while I love baseball and sports, my role in life is is to be a small part of providing a diversion for others. 
uh, what, when, and, and that really resonated when I'd start to hear from people on Twitter saying, Hey, my, you know, my, my mom or my grandmother or somebody is in the hospital or they're in hospice and they don't have much longer. And the one thing they look forward to every day is baseball. So I think about that a lot because whether it's sports or the arts or, I mean, we, you know, a good book, whatever it is, we could, fortunately we have the book. We, we, we have Netflix and all that, but yeah. uh, people need that distraction. And, and obviously they, they can't get that right now. So I hope that comes back soon. Hey, uh, did you, sorry to interrupt. Did you see my most recent blog? Uh, I did mention sports. Which is good. I uh, I decided that because KU, the men's basketball team at KU, finished as number one in the AP poll, that they are the national champions. I decided that. Yeah, I'm sure I, I, I'm here. here. Come here. Look at what he's wearing. Look at this. You're the only, you're the only, you're not the only one that decided that. All right, let's see here. You see this? You see this? Look who's here. Where does wow. KU go here? So this is good. This is you guys, good. Technically, yeah. they had a postseason win while KU didn't. So <laughs> I'm declaring K State as national champs well, okay. the, good, the, the good news is be out here the good news is that'll get the audience going by the way i was gonna uh, let everybody know who is watching this live that if you want to add a comment and i think that's pretty easy to do i, I get those comments and and i if there are any questions that you have for dr edwards yeah. um, send them send them our way and we, we probably have another I don't know. I've got another 15 20 minutes if, if you do and you let me know if you got to go too cuz much more important than, yeah, than anything that I'm doing. The, Dr. Schwartz running the, the, the shop. Okay. But it's not appropriate social distancing just then. Sorry. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I, you guys are in a different spot, obviously, yeah. than um, than many of us. But, I, you know, I, I, I'm hearing this question asked to so many healthcare workers, and, and you guys are the ones being, being called the heroes. I know I, I'm friends with so many people in the medical profession, first responders, and uh, I've met so many people in the military. No one's ever comfortable with that title, but I do think it's important for all of us to recognize what you do. What I want to know is is how how are you able to keep yourself safe if the PPE is a joke right now or it's not where it should be? Right. You've got potentially, and and so many others have decisions to make every single day too in terms of your safety, right? I mean. I think I made that decision 12 years ago when I went to medical school. Um, I don't know. We're, we're a pathological breed. You know, why does a fireman run into a burning building? Like it doesn't make sense. Um, you know, it's, I, it is what we do. It's an interesting, um, I think what I've learned as far as speaking about medicine and protecting ourselves specifically is that I had always relied on others to provide the protection for me. Um, you know, I'd always thought either public health would provide proper protocols and protective equipment, or the hospitals at which I'm working would provide masks and gowns and whatnot. And what this has taught me is that um, to a certain extent, you sort of have to take that responsibility yourself and kind of assume that you're going to have to step up and do what's right to protect you. And and frankly, by protecting myself, I'm protecting my patients. So this is ultimately about how do we stop the spread to patients? And so, um, you know, when I worked in the ER back, kind of when everything shut down here in Kansas on the 16th, 17th, 18th of March, I brought my own mask. I brought my own uh, protective equipment because I didn't trust that the hospital would have it. And sure enough, when I got there, they were not providing um, the proper PPE for, for physicians and staff. And so, you know, that was the step that I had to take for myself. And that's true over and over and over again across the U.S. So, But at the same time, what are we going to do? Not go to work? Right. Like, what, I mean, your choice is, so let's take, a, let's take a different example. So like, let's say at a construction site, the supervisor is not providing proper, you know, OSHA respirators, hard hats, et cetera, those type of things. Well, the construction, it shuts down. Like no, nobody works. So your choices are the hospital shuts down or your healthcare workers work without protection. That's it, those are the choices. And so that's the choice. I mean, we're continuing to work because that's what we do. Um, so we do the best we can. When I hear the phone ringing in the background, I hope it's nothing more than just one of the questions that you're getting every single day. Yeah. Um, so you've talked about communication and you know, thank God for technology now and the ability to 
to be able to see most of your patients the way you and I are talking here right now. That's, that's a, that's a helpful thing. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think for, for everyone, how many, obviously we can't get into details, but I, I mean, how many patients have you either seen or heard from that might have COVID-19 and then what have you done? Cause I know testing is still such an issue. Oh no, this is a great question. Sorry. I'm uh, pulling up here. Uh, we have screened 28, 27 people for testing and we have provided testing for 17 of them right now. Um, our clinic population is about, we take care of 500 patients here. So it's still a small percentage. Uh, what's crazy is that we got one test back 24 hours later and we are still waiting on other tests that we did like seven or eight days ago. Mm. There's, there's no rhyme or reason. Our, our representatives to our commercial lab vendor has no idea why this is happening. You know, we just have to trust that the system's gonna work. So our, our poor patients are sitting at home in quarantine feeling crummy and you know, thank goodness none of them have actually um, worsened um, and have needed to go to the hospital. But I mean, it, we're living in this world where everybody's doing the best they can and the best is kind of crummy. And typically in the past, you would have sent someone that's feeling crummy to the ER or, 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 or you would have seen them in person and, yeah, and they just have to wait. I mean, you don't want to flood the ER any more than no. it potentially is going to be. I mean, right. and I've thought about this a lot too. I know you have much more than I have, but there, there may come a point here where you need to make decisions right. that. I don't think you were ever, you know, you talked about the, this is what you signed up for and, and ultimately it is right. I mean, that's, that's part of being a doctor, a nurse, a healthcare worker. You knew that going in, you didn't know it'd be quite like this, but, but, but you know, you knew that there would be tough times and, and, and uncomfortable moments. And, and, and you as doctors, I think oftentimes have this ability to process differently than the rest of us. I'm not saying that that's easy either. Um, have you thought about if this thing gets real bad, how, how you're going to handle situations where you have to go one way or another? Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but no, it does. It does. I mean, there's no good answer. Um, I, ideally you work with your colleagues and people who can point out your ethical blind spots um, and come up with the best answer possible. Um, those who have served as medics in the military know the concept of triage really well. You save the people who you can save um, and prioritize saving them. But then the question is, how do you identify those people as opposed to those who you can't save? And that's where the ethical muddy waters comes in. And no matter what we do, we're going to do it wrong. We're, there's going to be, you know, in retrospect, it's going to be a lot of second guessing, a lot of critiquing. But at the same time, that's, I mean, we will learn from it um, as terrible as that sounds. Uh, this will be a, 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 an experience that none of us have really prepared for and there's no black and white guidance. So we're gonna make mistakes. And that's the sad truth. I have a question that came up. So I'm gonna pop it up on the screen. I don't know if it is a relative or not of yours, but it is the same last name. Yeah, I do know this person. Um, yeah. If I tell uh, if cloth face masks, could you use them? Uh, I am in, um, we are, we have protective equipment. However, we are trying to make it last. And so we would be happy to accept any donations that anybody um, has. Obviously you can, you can mail them to us. You don't have to come physically um, because again, we want to make sure everybody stays safe and, and distant. Um, when this first started, I actually was I was really I was like, oh no, you know, don't waste your supplies on us. Don't don't worry about us. But I think part of what's been interesting about this, and I don't know, Joel, if you've experienced this too, but um, is the community that has come out of this endeavor. Yes. I have talked with more people via FaceTime and Zoom, and I have um, had you know patients have sent us thank you letters for just doing what we're supposed to be doing and all of this. And so part of how I'm giving back in like the small human way that I can is that I, you know, I, yes, if you have a gift, if you have something to offer, we're here to accept it because if we can't use it, we will certainly make sure we find somebody who can. Let me do this while we are talking. Yeah. Uh, 
if somebody wants to mail you, do you want, you want, I mean, I know that we've got the KC, um, yeah. DPC.com. So I could probably figure out how to contact you via there, but I could put up a, an address too, if you sure. want. So yeah. give me that right now. Um, the, the magic of live web stream. Ooh, 2016, so 2016 West 43rd Avenue. And that's KCK 66103. So see, we're, we'll just, and you know what? Nothing needs to be perfect right now. That's what I've learned. Just, just don't worry about capitalizations. I think um, Kansas good. City, Kansas. What's the zip, Allison? Uh, 66103. You know, yeah, what we're doing? a bottle of conditioner today. <laughs> I was like, I don't know what we're going to use this for. I think it was a gift for um, one of the nurses, but um, people are just being really nice and, and we will accept uh, with, with just a humble gratitude. Um, you know what people are able to do and again repurpose the things that we can't immediately use all right so we have that up there so that's a good thing uh i've got another question coming in and this one is from david wetzel will the new rapid five minute test be usable at dr edwards clinic and others like it how promising is this development i started hearing about that the last couple of days and yeah. started thinking wow if this could happen this would be a big step where are we at with that right now and, and how about you so we we've ordered this um we've also ordered gowns and they've been like in process uh for week um so we've ordered it so it is our goal to provide this service to initially the members that we take care of once we work out kinks and make sure our members' needs are addressed um, to a wider community. Um, I think that this test, the, the testing that we're currently doing, all of these modalities are, so long as they are um, accurate, is kind of, everything is happening so quickly. There is there's a little concern that I have with, you know, validation testing, et cetera. Um, so long as they're accurate, I think this is going to be monumental for helping us uh, be more specific about the way that we recommend people behave, quarantine, getting real numbers. Uh, you know, our public health epidemiological data is terrible right now. We have no idea how many actual cases there are, are in the U.S. Right. Um, and so we really don't know how fatal it is because we can't tell you how many people actually have it. Um, and so... I think it's a super promising development because of the rapidity at which we'll be able to start to process things. Um, and so as long as we get it, um, we're going to start using it and then definitely as soon as we can. All right. Thanks to David for that question. And I think we probably have, oh, maybe another 10 minutes of some more questions come in. I like the fact that, that and, and, and again, the beauty of uh, certainly podcasts and now this video world that we're living in is that it, this is, this is not like, oops, I missed it at 12. I can't watch it. It'll be up and, and all over the internet all day long. And I know Allison will put yeah. it out there and I'll put it out there. By yeah. the way, I, I do keep getting people tell me I, I, I still go to my face all the time, but I just always I have. I put, my, I put my hands on here. I did this. I keep touching. I'm drinking coffee. I'm yeah, doing all this. I'm drinking. I, I just, you know. Oh, here, give me some. Give me some. Yeah, yep, give me yep, there we go. Let's I can't okay. waste it, Allison. I oh, can't God. waste it. Um, You know what has really been amazing? Uh, I think Andy Rieger is joining me on Friday. Awesome. Uh, a lot of people that we know in the entrepreneurial world are just chipping in mm -hmm. in ways. And I, I'm looking forward to talking to Andy on, on Friday. But, you know, here he's got this amazing distillery and they, they've taken off and they, 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 they built this, you know, beautiful place that's entertaining people and it's become a hotspot. And now suddenly that is shut down and, and you're thinking I'm out of business. And then suddenly you're in the business of, of making hand sanitizer for yeah. uh, initially for people like me or anybody in the community. Right. And then suddenly it was, wait a minute, the, the medical community, the healthcare world needs it. And so they're, they're making it for them and, and not just to single him out. There's so many, how amazing has it been to just watch? Yeah. I mean, you talked about the messaging you're getting from people, yeah. which by the way, you said, I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. It's got to feel good to be able to hear that from people too, as that picked me up. I mean, I know you're being humble. I get it, but you know, it will be much worse if nobody said anything. We'll put it that way, you know. So, so people are paying attention to what you and all your colleagues across the world are doing. But how uplifting is it just to see the creativity and the the pivots that so many companies have taken? Yeah, I was talking with um, a reporter this morning, and the reporter asked me, "Like, any silver linings? Anything? Anything? Is it all doom and gloom?" I'm like, "No, there's so many silver linings." I mean, 
again, we're, we're a little bit in the calm before the storm. And I think we're all going to have a lot of loss and there, um, we will all have grief that will, that will happen. But if we are going to call out a few silver linings, other than KU winning the national championship per my declaration, um, it's that we are in a period of rapid fire innovation. If, yes. you know, everybody has to adapt and they have to do it quickly. I was telling somebody else that we've reinvented our business model every three days for the last two weeks. And mm-hmm. I'm exhausted and my sleep is completely, in- I was dreaming about, um, uh, oh my God, I was dreaming about how to talk to my patients about the end of their life and what, like what they want in end of life decisions. Like that was in my dreams last night. But at the same time, what my brain was saying is, well, how do I convey this to my population? How do I make it so it's accessible? My The average age of the people I take care of is 32. People don't think about this when they're young and healthy. Um, but it needs to be something that I can make not heavy handed, uh, you know, and, and accessible. And so um, to watch like Rieger switch over to hand sanitizing is amazing to watch, um, you know, other small businesses adapt and create more content like like you. This is amazing. Like you're bringing a lot of information to the community in this methodology. And and there are larger changes too, like the way that insurance is reimbursing healthcare providers has changed massively over the last week as well to keep small businesses, small, small practices afloat. So uh, innovation, I think, is going to be a, a huge silver lining coming out of this. Got another question. We've got oh, maybe five or so more minutes. So if anybody wants to send in questions, it's a great opportunity to get an answer uh, on the fly. Mm. Let's see what we have here from Lindsay Williams as a provider. What sources are you using to stay most current on COVID-19 developments to where do you direct patients? So I, so I know uh, Dr. Williams, she and I went to medical school together. Mm-hmm. And this is a conversation that I have had continuously with other physicians in the area nationwide. The, um, we are not, as physicians, we are not immune to the rapid fire updates and misinformation and hearing so much, it's hard to filter out what is and what is not real. And so the most reputable uh, sources, at least locally, are obviously the Kansas Department of of Health and Education and the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services. They both have websites. They both update them almost on a daily basis, if not multiple times a day. And so that's going to give you really good local information. Um, Also, the CDC has a massive website. It's almost getting to the point where it's too big to digest, um, but they're an excellent primary source of information. Um, As for how to keep clinically updated um this I mean, this is probably a little bit uh heretical to say but keeping in close contact with your social networks and other doctors who are at the front lines of this has been the fastest way to figure out the best way to treat people our usual publication process where we do a study submit it to a journal the journal reviews it it gets published that takes years we don't have years we have minutes we have hours you know we have days and so keeping in really close contact with providers who are doing the best they can is how we how we learn, and there are and there are studies going on. So, to the public and patients listening, um, we will have better information. Just it's not it's it's hard. Science takes a while. It just does. Yeah. I was wondering about that too. Thanks to Dr. Williams for the question. Uh, these things take forever, and you know the 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 drugs and all the different and and, and we've seen so much. So I think social media from this standpoint is it's a double-edged sword because it is a great way to inform people, but then you have to sift through all the BS that's out there yeah. and all the all the fake stuff. And 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 I'm not talking about quote unquote fake news. I'm just talking about all it takes is any one of us to go out there and say, yeah. hey, do this. And and that could go viral, which is no pun intended on that at all. That's that's dangerous. But it is now we have to speed this process along. Yeah. So where where's the balance between so I keep saying you you we don't have time right now for perfection right in anything we're doing. So right. like you know, I've had guests on the show that say, Oh, I'm sorry, there was a little distraction or the, the audio cut out for a minute. Who cares? Let's just go. Yeah. This this isn't a live um national television broadcast. Oh, by the way, if it is, that's okay too. That's where we're at. <laughs> I know. So how do so how do you balance this safety part of it, I know this is more probably a government question it versus is. the need in the moment. And and I think that that, and, and not to be political, but to simply just state kind of how things have shaken out. 
I think that the initial response from the federal government was aired on the side of being perfect. And really what we needed was good. We just needed good and we needed yeah. action. And so um, more than one uh, medical professional will, will tell you the saying, and I'm sure this is true in different industries, is that perfect is the enemy of good. Like there are some times when you just got to be good and you got to keep moving and we're in that era. And so um, but to your point, Joel, it's we're going to we are going to make mistakes. There are there are there are going to be mistakes and we're not used to as a profession making mistakes. Our whole job is to is to be perfect and to do the right thing. But at this point, we're going to do the best thing we can do and keep moving because we got to. So we're, we're winding down here in a few minutes. I just want to remind everybody again. You have. Dr. Edwards, um, her clinic, uh, the website up there. If you have anything that could help that you want to send, do it. Um, the need is going to be there. And I think, as you said, Allison, I mean, if, if, if you don't need it, you could pass it on to others. It's a, it's a very tight knit community, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, in fact, when we opened up testing for um, COVID-19, we shared that with all of our direct primary care colleagues in the metro and said we would be happy to take care of your patients and do that for them. So we are we're very tight knit. I will also say that I'm like I mentioned earlier, we are updating our blog on a on a weekly basis and they will have uh, within our blogs on a weekly basis. We have links to the CDC, to the Kansas and Missouri uh, state departments that I mentioned to different relevant news stories that are good primary sources to try and and cut through all the social media stuff. So that's on our blog, on our website. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot there, but the, the website, uh, and and I know that Allison's very, very active with, with blogging and all that stuff in the middle of everything else going on. A couple final questions and, yeah. and I'll let you go. Um, everyone's going through this right now where they, they suddenly feel like they have a sore throat or a runny nose and it's not like it was in the past. It's, oh my gosh, is this it? Is this not it? Is it, you know, we were on vacation in Florida. Thankfully we drove, we were in a private spot. Uh, but you know, going to Walmart a few times to get groceries, you're still close to people. Mm -hmm. We were very aware of, okay, anything you touched right away, wash the hands, right. but still had to come back, uh, finishing up a 14 day quarantine right now. And you get a little sore throat, but wait a minute is, and then it passed. Okay. Nothing. Um, yeah. What do you tell people right now when they start getting something because everyone's mind goes to that. It's human nature. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is, this is about a hundred percent of my job right now is talking to people about this. So, um, stating just cold, hard facts, uh, a vast majority of people will probably contract COVID-19. Um, we can reduce that by social distancing, staying home, obviously good hand hygiene, not touching your face, all those things that we've heard about. Um, but people will get this. What's incredibly reassuring is that 80% of people will have what we call a mild disease. Now, when you hear the term mild disease, I want you to remember that that's like our, like the, the, the physician definition of mild. You might still feel crummy. Like you might still have a cough. You might have a sore throat. You might have a fever. You might have all those things that nobody wants. But in the, in the big picture, when we say mild disease, what we're talking about is that you don't have to go to the hospital. So that's, I think that's the first thing I really try and clear up is that you can still feel really crummy, but be you can be okay at home. Mm -hmm. About 15% of people are, are going to need to be admitted into the hospital setting. And these are people that are having trouble with breathing is usually what causes the admission to the hospital. And so everybody uh, is immediately going to be like, oh, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Well, you can't breathe with anxiety too. And so um, the big thing I tell people to look for is if you can't speak in full sentences. So if you start to have this problem where you can't talk through a whole sentence without having to take a breath, that's a problem. That's a problem. You need to contact a healthcare professional or call EMS immediately. Um, if you can't do that, your usual activity. So going up, you know, if you have a flight of stairs in your house that you have no problem with, if that becomes something where you become breathless, that's something where you need to reach out to get health uh, healthcare support. And then about 5% of people will actually probably need ICU care. And, and that's really what the big scary thing is about is that our capacity for taking care of that many people in the ICU is gonna be difficult. And that's where you hear about resources like needing ventilators and whatnot. So if you think about that, 95% of people are, are going to get this illness and also be okay in the end. Um, and, and, I, and I just, that's a very small fact to hold on to, but it is, it's true. And there will be 5% of people who will have a, a, a not a very good course. And um, 
and that's why our you know our collective heart breaks but that's kind of what i've been telling people does that make yeah. sense yeah it does i mean i and and a lot of people I mean, I just saw before we went on that Chris Cuomo of CNN is uh, was diagnosed and yeah. he's going to continue doing his show unless he can't from from his basement at home. And yeah. and and I hope he continues doing the show because it means that he's, you know, he's healthy enough to do it. And obviously, if you are experiencing a lot of that loss of breath and bad fevers and all of that, yeah. you, you can't continue doing what you're doing. My last question, I, I think uh, it's been talked about enough of where this is potentially going and then how we hopefully get past it and hopefully testing comes and, mm -hmm. and, and, and then we can know who has, who doesn't and quarantine properly instead of everyone having to be quarantined. So that that's hopefully sooner rather than later. We'll see. You're not going to like this question, but I'll ask it anyway. How are you taking care of yourself? Because I know that you will run yourself into the ground. I don't mean to sound like, you know, yeah. your dad, I'm not that much older than you, but mm -hmm. um, no, how are you, you know, how, how are you, you, you you still have to be able to sleep and function. Oh, I know. Um, somebody goes, what if you get sick? And I was like, not planning on doing that, <laughs> which like is a stupid answer. It's a stupid answer. Um, but I've been trying to keep up with my routines. With the weather being nice, I'm a runner, um, even though I'm getting old and like my hip hurts. But I will go out and I, I actually, oh, my God, I got a sunburn on Saturday because I didn't wear sunscreen because I'm not used to it. But um you know, I went out on my four mile run on Sunday or Saturday, uh, did yoga on Sunday, trying to keep my exercise routine up. Um, sleep has been hard. I mean, I think everybody's probably having that sort of anxiety because everything is so unknown and we don't have control over it. So that, that will cause problems with sleep. Um, I'm trying to eat well. I did make macaroni and cheese last week, which is like uh. comfort food, <laughs> but, but still trying to do vegetables. And I mean, beyond that, um, you know, I'm doing the best I can with hand washing and uh, keeping safe social distance. I mean, all the same things everybody else is doing. And so um, my partner is doing the same. Our, our nurse is working from home to kind of to keep separated. We have we have the technology where she can answer the phone and still do a lot of a lot of patient care from home. And so, I mean, doing the same thing everybody else is doing. So. All right. Well, if if anyone wants to get a hold of Allison, Casey dpc.com Kansas City Kansas City direct primary care and and there's just so much information on the website blogs and and all of that and so I first off thank you for for doing this and maybe you know maybe maybe I don't want to make you a recurring guest but I'll probably want you to come I, back I, at some point. Any time. I mean like I said I'm, I'm I'm doing the best I can to stay up on on all of this and I know yeah. even dr Williams's example like talking to all my medical you know, colleagues and friends, like this is a catharsis for some of us to talk. Well, thanks for sharing. I'm proud to call you a friend and anything that I can do on my end, um, minus a Gatorade bucket at this point, oh, yeah. um, you, you let me know, I'll share it, that you know that. So uh, you, you have many, many ways to get a hold of me. You know how to do that. Text it, email it, tweet it, whatever the heck you want to do, let me know and I'll get it out there. And and most importantly, uh, keep doing the work you're doing. Stay safe, please. Take care of your husband at home or vice versa. And, <laughs> um, and make sure you have a beer at some point too. And, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, we're, we're all going to get through this. Yeah, we are. So. Thank you, Joel. Really means a lot. All right. Yep. Appreciate it. Thanks, Allison. I'll let you get back to work. We're going to pull her off of there right now and I'll let her go. So um, if she's still listening, cause I could kind of see her uh, off of the camera, she's waving goodbye, go work, go do what you gotta do. Stop paying attention to what, what I have going on. Um, anyway, that was a, a conversation that I wanted to have. I uh, will continue to have meaningful conversations in the entrepreneurial wor world and beyond. Uh, hopefully conversations that can give people hope or educate, inspire, whatever it might be. So, um, uh, Big thanks to all of you. My ask is just, just share this. Share the links on whatever, wherever we put it up on social media or where Allison does or any of my guests do. Share it. Let, let's all continue to help each other. I will be back here live tomorrow at noon. So thanks for watching Rounding the Bases Live presented by Enterprise Bank and Trust. Have a healthy and a safe Tuesday. Thanks, everyone.